What is going on, YouTube? It's Pete coming in hot with another video, also known as That Guy Pete You Refuse to Invite to Gatherings. Or, if you're here from Thinking Ape, then you probably know me as the Lord of Gingers, the Scion of Dagda, and the Baron of Brooklyn. <laughs> Today, we're here to talk about dogs. Dogs as companions, the unconditional love they have for us, them being man's best friend. Got an article here um, talking about how dogs basically became man's best friend in two different locations, basically the two halves of the old world, Europe and Asia, and um, how that came to be and you know why I personally think having a dog is is fantastic, especially in modern times where we're basically invisible to the opposite sex and um, we're treated essentially like second class citizens. So yeah, we're going to talk about that. But before I do, I wanted to give a quick shout out to Sir Yidis. Uh He did a pretty good podcast yesterday. I recommend strongly that you go check it out and uh, that you probably download it just in case, you know, YouTube police show up. He had two heavy hitters on there. Um, he had Turd Flinging Monkey and Sandman. And um, what I like about these guys, I mean, yes, they're part of the Manosphere. They're part of the Red Pill space, in particular, MGTOW um, as a way of life. And what I what I like about them, aside from the fact that, you know, these guys are like the OGs, um, you have Turd Flinging Monkey, who kind of offers an American perspective, and you have Sandman, who offers a Canadian perspective. You know, our brothers to the north, Frosty Brothers, eh? Um, it's, uh, you know, it's kind of good that, you know, through this space, we can kind of get connected to each other and see that, like, um, yeah, we're all dealing with the same shit in the West. And, you know, folks in Western Europe are pretty much in the same boat as us. And it's always good to see this perspective, but what was really, really good about this particular stream, way back in the potato collection, I did a video that Red Pill, the Manosphere, it goes beyond intersex relations, but like we talk about intersex relations a lot in this space. This podcast was a fantastic example of how RP awareness, and to a lesser degree, BP awareness, Black Pill awareness, it really does go beyond the relations between men and women. Yes, that, that's a very big part of the discussion, right? Because it's kind of like a direct link to how men have a stake in society, right? If men aren't building families with women, it's like, well, what the hell am I, well, what's my stake? But beyond that, when you have people who kind of subscribe to this alternate modern type of thinking, you put those people in power, what type of system do you get? What type of results do you get? How is the layperson going to react to that as a result of things getting more and more authoritarian? If this is your cup of tea, these are the type of topics that you're interested in. Um, I think Turd Flinging Monkey and Sandman both have fantastic insights from the American and Canadian sectors, respectively. And um, hey, um, if there's any you know heavy hitting Western European guys in this space, um, we can definitely. Um, show those guys support as well and you know if they get big enough maybe they can come in and tell us you know about the western europe and what that's like um we even have you know migtow even has a following in eastern europe like the eurasian region primarily russia called misp which is like the russian version of it so the point is this stuff is spreading um the average man is starting to look around like something's fucked up something ain't right and if you just want to see how things go beyond the intersex um situation like it's more than just getting you know left on red scene and delivered it's more than just men being invisible to women it's more than just you know divorce court and gyn gynocentric systems and stuff like this that affect men it goes all the way up to the top a system-wide situation which is more of a, a yellow pill concept um you can go to the medicine cabinet and check out yellow pill if you don't know what the hell i'm talking about but the point is that it was a good podcast you should check it out all right that's the core show them support it's fantastic content and um i think yeah if we can get more of the layman awake and aware 
that is a win because then as men, you can make more informed decisions in your lives, so on and so forth. And of course, as always, um, I reserve the right to be wrong about stuff. So if you have any insights from your own experiences that you'd like to share in the comment sections when I discuss topics, um, I'm starting to run out of them, though, but I'm trying to, like, you know, find things to talk about. Um, there's only so much, right? You can always share it. I had a fantastic conversation in my last video about, um, you know, um, ketones versus, um, you know, just other standard uh, body fat and things like this. Just when that's where the keto diet comes from. And just having all these things explained to me, read the comments. I encourage you to do so. There, there's a lot of gold that my subs are dropping in those comment sections. So again, if I don't know, somebody else does. We're all in this together. We're all working together, pooling our knowledge. And as a result, we're all better for it. So yeah, read the comments. You'll learn a lot, just as I have. So let's go ahead and get started with the topic. I think that's enough uh, fluff, right? We're here to talk about dogs, dogs being man's best friend, okay? So we're going to read an article from uh, Reuters, Thomson Reuters. Um, this article was written about five years ago. It's a bit old, but it's called How Dogs Became Man's Best Friend, Twice Over. So as always, uh, for those who have been here for a while, you kind of know how this format goes. Uh, for those of you who don't, I pretty much read the article and I kind of sprinkle my thoughts as we go. It's usually how it goes. For those who have been binging the content, you probably have encountered a few of these videos already, so you already know. Let's go ahead and get started. So, beginning with the article, ancient humans made dogs their best friend, not once, but twice, by domesticating two separate populations of wolves thousands of miles apart in Europe and Asia. That is the conclusion of scientists who said recently they had used modern genetics to unravel canine evolutionary history revealing a deep internal split between dogs from opposite ends of the Eurasian continent. People and hounds go way back. They were living together at least 15,000 years ago, or 5,000 years before cows, goats, pigs, chickens, you know, all the farm animals, horses. So, obviously dogs and humans go have a much deeper and richer history with one another. But how, why, when, and where did these two species get so friendly? That's been a mystery. It is widely believed dogs were tamed just once, with some experts claiming it happened in Europe and others believed it happened in Asia, more specifically China. But a new story emerged when researchers used the inner ear bone from a 4,800-year-old dog unearthed in Ireland, woo woo, my home, represent, <laughs> to sequence its full genome, and then compared it to both modern animals and DNA traces from 59 ancient dogs. Yeah, genetics, man, they tell quite a story. Our DNA really is our story. Yeah, it's it's so fascinating how they could just unpack the genes, look at it, and, and tell a story based on it. But our data suggests that dogs were domesticated twice on both sides of the old world, said Laurent Franz, a geneticist at the University of Oxford, whose work was published in the Journal of Science. And I mean, from where I stand, this kind of makes sense, right? Um, probably a while back, I did a 23andMe, uh, DNA test because I, I wanted to know, like, you know, what I really was. It pretty much came back majority Northwestern European, like British Isles, which is Ireland and, um, the mainland Britain. So basically Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, um, Republic of Ireland, um, and England, like that's part of my, um, genetic makeup with a little bit of French and German. There definitely is German. I looked at Ancestry and looked through my past. There's some German. Haven't really seen a lot of French, but apparently it's possible that it's there. And then on the other end is my uh, my Scandinavian roots, primarily Swedish. So, you know, the, uh, the, Norse, the Norse gods alongside the Celtic gods may be watching over me as well, um, if those gods are to be believed. So... What I'm getting at from going to 23andMe and all this stuff is that when you go and look at it, there's what's called I, I, um, your father's paternal haplogroup and your mother's maternal haplogroup. And basically what they do is they can plot the course of how your family's 
sort of branched out. Again, this is for Homo sapiens um, only. There are others. Um, for example, Neanderthals. Um, I think Denisovians, Florians might be one as well. The point is, yeah, Homo sapiens is the one that came out on top, but it wasn't the only breed of human. So this is just Homo sapiens we're talking about. Apparently, they started out in East Africa. Okay. They branched out across Mount Sinai. They went to the Arabian Peninsula. And then kind of at that point, they branched out from there. Right. So some of them went towards East Asia and maybe bred with other species of human, perhaps. Um, if someone wants to tell me that part of history, feel free to do so in the comments. Another branch went up towards the Eurasian steppe. That's kind of like the flatlands. It go, cuts up into Russia and they went up into there. Um, and then some of them kind of cut in from the east into Europe. And then others cut up through the Balkan Peninsula. I went through there. And then everybody kind of knows the history from there about how some of the populations on the Eurasian continent, they went up towards the eastern edge of Russia. They crossed the Bering Strait, went in through Alaska, and then cut down the western coast of North America and then spread to Central and South America. And then later on, the Europeans came over across 1492. Christopher Columbus sailed the ocean blue and and did a bunch of terrible things. <laughs> and then, um, yeah, that was kind of like the rest of history. You know, stuff we learned in school, pretty much. So um, what I'm getting at from this is that, okay, the human population kind of split off at the Arabian Peninsula. So the idea that encountering dogs or wolves, which is like what came before dogs, I guess, Encountering that in two different places, highly plausible, I would say. I think that's very plausible. It makes sense. And something as simple as just kind of looking at your haplogroups in 23andMe, something like that can kind of give you some background knowledge that can make you look at something like this and go, no, it's not that far-fetched. Kind of makes sense. But um, this suggests that at least two groups of humans independently came to the same conclusion. Dogs can be domesticated. And this raises another question. Coming to that conclusion, right? Did we kind of just have a bunch of on and off switches in our genetics and epigenetics, which is like the way that the environment kind of turns on and off these switches, so to speak, right? That's kind of how the environment interacts. That's how it inputs into our genetic code and sequence, how, how things play out. It really makes you wonder, like, were we just kind of predisposed to bond with dogs specifically? It's very interesting that two groups of people on two sides of the old world could reach the same conclusion. Fascinating. But hey, were it not for that, um, that situation, dogs probably would not be our best friend today. But it also suggests that the process of domestication, which is pretty rare, exactly, it could be replicated more often than we think. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So after constructing a family tree for dogs based on the genetic data, the scientists concluded there were very old domesticated animals in both the east and west of Eurasia, but not in the middle. That is like the Middle East. Because again, if you look at the haplogroups, where did they branch out? Exactly. That was the branch out point. So the people that kind of hung out in the Arabian Peninsula, chilling in the deserts and shit, yeah, they probably weren't really breeding a lot of dogs in the desert, but then you branch out with different ecosystems and things like that. Yeah, makes more sense because most of the people moved on and kept migrating and spreading out. But at some point in prehistory, they believed the eastern dogs dispersed with human migrants and replaced most of the western ones. So Asian ancestry is now dominant in modern dogs. I'm guessing this means like the primary breeds that came out on top in the eastern part of the old world. Most dogs of today kind of descend from that, I'm guessing. Um, that's what they mean. Although it is possible there was only one domestication event in Asia, followed by early transportation to Europe. Um, the research team argues the lack of archaeological evidence for dogs in the middle of the continent makes this very unlikely. Right? Because the logic there is, hey, if you got a bunch of Asians over here chilling, and they're like, hey, 
let's go and bring these dogs to the western part of the old world you would think they would have sold some dogs along the way and you know some shit would have happened in the middle along the way but evidence seems to suggest there's no archaeological records there is also a lot of sand in the middle though so i don't know how much sand would you have to dig under to find dog bones if they're even there so could be one of those mysteries that we never really know for sure but other scientists not involved in the work believe more samples from ancient dogs and wolves will be needed to prove the point conclusively exactly grab your shovel start digging <laughs> uh but i think archaeologists they live for that shit they love that they can't get enough of it so we may have a definitive answer at some point but records seem to suggest that it developed in two different parts of the world but what remains unclear is how gray wolves started down the long road that has ended up in today's kaleidoscope of dog breeds from afghan hounds to yorkshire terriers the idea that it began with a hunter gatherer picking up a wolf pup and breeding tamer and tamer offspring is probably too simple according to gregor larson a genetics expert in oxford's archaeology department it's likely to have been co-evolution at first the pack of wolves got close to humans then humans got used to the wolves, and finally there would have been something more intentional on the part of the people. Correct. So, now that we've laid out this article, which was very fascinating, by the way, on the history of how we evolved the domestication um, of dogs and things like this, now I think we can kind of unpack it and see, well, how what would it have been like for the wolves and the humans to live together? Well, I suspect it would probably be something like what they said the wolves kind of saw the humans the humans saw the wolves and the humans were like eh, i don't know if i want to screw with them for food when there's easier prey and then the wolves were probably sizing up the humans the same way like eh, these guys got stone tip spears and shit i don't know if i want to mess with them they hunt in packs we hunt in packs mm, maybe we could both get more food if we hunt together right and over time, that's exactly what happened. The men would go out on the hunt with these wolfhounds, I guess. And when you come back home from the hunt with the food, the wolves got to eat, the men got to eat, the women got to eat. And when the wolves came back to the camp, it was the women that nurtured them and took care of them and things like this, just like they did with humans, children growing up. And probably over time, as a familiarity came between wolves and, and humans, if like a wolf pup was found abandoned or something, yeah, humans would probably be more inclined to take them in because of the familiarity between the two, right? So over time, as more and more generations got bred for this, that bond between men and dogs, humanity and dogs, if you want to be more general, it developed into this almost innate thing over time. 15,000 years, that's a long time, right? So the way the genetic program is written to optimize survival for both the dog and the human, it would seem that natural selection selected for this symbiotic relationship between canines and humans, which of course is really, really good. Now, of course, if you look at the feminist spin on this, a feminist spin might say something like, well, actually, actually, <laughs> dogs are women's best friend because um, dogs are more receptive to women because they nurture and caretake and things like this. But what we're trying to say when we say dogs are man's best friend, at least in the context of this space, what we're trying to say is that dogs are probably the only creature that will love a man specifically, unconditionally because of that close relationship we have with them. They help us, they, their noses are better than ours, they help us sniff out things. Um, you know, they can run faster. Um, they like, again, it's I kind of look at it in the sense of hunting, they're just an extension of what we're already capable of as humans. So dogs just made a natural good fit for us, for sure. But nowadays, I mean, the need to go out and hunt isn't there anymore. So. The genetics that make these dogs love us unconditionally, it's all still there. But again, it's its not used for hunting and things like this. You just go to Petco and buy some food. And then you go to the grocery store and buy your own food. And then there you go. But if Turd, Flinging Monkey, and Sandman are onto something with the future 
of the world, then um, we may have to crack out those genes again. Um, ideally, I'd like to not do that. I don't want to even begin to guess at my odds. But um, yeah, it is food for thought. So now that I've laid all that out, I guess we can just kind of round it out with my experience um, dealing with dogs. So as you all know, um, especially in you know the video about like why I don't date and things like this, I spend a lot of time by myself, right? But something that I have mentioned a few times that, you know, obviously in the context of intersex relations, it causes a real hit to status because, uh, you know, hypergamy is absolutely ruthless in all regards, right? So I live in a walk-in apartment downstairs in my house. Upstairs is my mother, my stepfather, and my special needs brother, one with autism. My other brother lives five blocks away with his wife. So we're all pretty close. We're all pretty tight knit. And unfortunately, in that type of situation, women will judge you very harshly for still kind of living in close proximity and things like this. It's a mark of not being independent. It's a mark of not being strong, this, that, and the third. Whether or not it's right or incorrect or whatever you want to call it, coincidental, not really relevant to this topic, but genetically speaking, they could be onto something. That's not the point. The point is, because I, I live here, I have access to a dog <laughs> upstairs. That's what I'm trying to get at. So this is my dog, Oliver. He's a cockapoo. I call him Ollie. And this is my brother's dog, Daisy. Pretty sure she's a German Shepherd, Labrador, some other shit mix. She's a mutt. Let me tell you. One thing, like as a man, when you have a dog or access to a dog, it doesn't matter how good your day is. It doesn't matter how shitty your day is. When you come home, this dog is so excited to see you. The genuine love that this dog shows you, whether it's genetics that drives it or not, to be honest, I don't really give a shit. The, the love is just there. And again, when you compare that to the conditional love, that you get from a woman. Oh, I just don't feel like I'm in love with you anymore. <laughs> Divorce. Like when you compare that, I think a man, if he can afford to do so, or if he is in a privileged position like I am where somebody else has the dog and I could just, you could just go visit them whenever you want. You owe it to yourself to at least entertain the idea, right? Because having a dog, it, it will show you what unconditional love looks like what it feels like to be on the receiving end of unconditional love. Because as a man, you're not really going to receive that from a woman. You're just, you're not, okay? There's strings attached to her love. Now, here's the thing. She can genuinely desire you and all that stuff. And, you know, we always say in the manosphere, it's, she's not yours, it's just your turn, right? This idea that, yeah, listen, she may have genuine desire for you, and that's a fantastic um you know, foundation for a relationship, genuine desire. It's fantastic, but it's, it's kind of fleeting. If you're not careful, you're always towing this hypergamous line where if you don't meet the burden of performance, which is expected of you as a man, it's encoded into us. You're out. You're out. More so if there's an alpha imprint in place, you're out. And even if there isn't an alpha imprint in place, FOMO. You could still be out. So it's a very dangerous game to play if you're looking for love in Alderaan places. <laughs> I had to make the Star Wars joke. I'm sorry. But with dogs, you don't really have to worry about that. Sure, companionship and, you know, sexual intimacy with a woman. Obviously, those are not the same thing. Not going to say that. But what I am going to say is having a companion like that, like a dog that just really loves you for you. That's a very beautiful thing. And it's the kind of it's the kind of support that again a lot of people take for granted if they have a dog and they've just sort of had one and never really gave it much thought. But a dog that just like is always happy to see you, always wagging his tail, you know, tongue hanging out of his face, just like, oh my god, man, you are the shit, you're the best, and you're just looking at your dog like, no, you're the best, <laughs> man. Again, once you have a dog. You'll experience it. And, and I kick myself because 
you know, up until I was probably about, um, what was it? Maybe when I was like, I don't know, 21, when my stepdad first moved in, he brought in a Pomeranian named Beauty um, with him. And um, yeah, again, until I like really felt that from a dog, I didn't realize how awesome dogs were. So again, food for thought, food for thought for sure. So I wanted to share my experience having a dog um, in my life, having two dogs in my life um, in some capacity. It just, it feels good that some creature on this earth gives a shit about you and there's no strings attached. That's a great feeling. And I think women in particular, they take it for granted that men have the propensity to love idealistically and unconditionally without strings attached. Um, and the only way, not, not the only way, but like the main way that a man will leave a relationship is that if you basically, if you piss on it and cheat on him or something like this, that's, what's going to make him leave. He's not just going to fall out of love with you. Like it just, it, it very rarely plays out like that. And if it does play out like that, it raises the question if he ever really liked you in the first place. Okay. So that's pretty much it on the dog side. And I guess on the other side is uh, our cats, uh, women's best friends. Well, I mean, think about cats compared to dogs, right? Cats, I've always kind of looked at them like they can be affectionate. And, you know, there clearly is a bond domestication wise with cats similar to dogs. But cats always, to me, seemed a little bit more standoffish. It doesn't help that I'm allergic to cats. But they've just always seemed a little bit more standoffish than dogs are. A little bit more push-pull with cats. And perhaps maybe that's why women like cats. Because it kind of just, you know, a little bit more their speed. Uh, but it's clear that, again, men love idealistically. And when a dog reflects that idealistic love back, it's a beautiful thing. And I also think this is why men, you know, in the friendship uh, realm, they, they make such good friends. Because, again, there's this goodwill and idealism between the men that's understood and... It's again, it's a beautiful thing. But when you're someone who runs on opportunism and looking for the best hypergamy at all given times, again, I can understand it's it's psychologically. Um, yeah, it, it, it messes you up. But just as men can really think about this stuff and get socially calibrated and things like this, women can get rationally calibrated and really think about this stuff if they want to. They have frontal lobes just like we do. So the thing is, though, that using that and getting rationally calibrated is not the path of least resistance and most people they they want to take the path of least resistance so the moral of the story for this video at its core is dogs are man's best friend for sure and the main reason why dogs are man's best friend is because again they can mirror this idealistic unconditional love for a man that he gives to the dog that basically nobody else can there is no you need to protect and provide for me type deal with a dog. Yes, you do that for your dog. But the dog just inherently loves you. You're just not going to get that anywhere else. You're not going to bond with a cat like that, probably. You're not going to bond with your livestock. <laughs> Definitely not. You're taking them to the slaughterhouse, right? But your horse, you're probably not going to bond with your horse the same way you bond with a dog. But I would think it comes pretty close. Perhaps people who um, live a more rural life can tell me about bonding with a horse um, and how that relationship dynamic works companion-wise. Um, it would be interesting, I'm sure. But dogs definitely obviously are man's best friend, number one. For, and I encourage men who can afford it and you know so on, get one. For me, in like I talked about the mental health video for myself, you know, some people liked it. Um, some people didn't. There was a minority that didn't. Um, you know, say what you will about all that. But I think having a dog is a big part of that mental support that's really, really good for a guy because again, we've seen time and time again, uh, women mock us, modern women in particular, they mock us. They mock us for having psychological vulnerability. Dogs will not do that to us. Okay. I risk rambling if I keep going. So I suppose we can continue the conversation in the comment section. So that's all I've got to say about dogs and the relationship between them and men and the unconditional love that they mirror from us. Makes you wonder if we taught them that while out on the hunt. So feel free to leave a like. Feel free to leave a dislike. 
call me an asshole if you disagree. It's all good. What I would be more open to is you outlining in a comment why you disagree. I might learn something from you. You might learn something from me. But people who disagree with me, like, fundamentally, usually they'll just leave a dislike and walk away. They don't explain it. And you don't have to. But just understand that um, nobody understands you or your position if you remain silent. Um, whatever you do, don't report the video, though. It's good information. It helps people. It gives them insight. And that's always a good thing. Um, if you like the content, go ahead and subscribe. If you don't like the content, you disagree with something I said, go ahead and unsubscribe. I had somebody unsubscribe um, from me earlier today because um, because of you know something that that I talked about and he was like, well, I don't agree with that. So I'm going to unsubscribe. Good luck to you. And I was just like, yeah, it's no problem, bro. I appreciate the honesty. You know, that's how you have to be. You have to be transparent, not take it personally and all that good stuff. Um, that being said, though, if you want to hear more, I encourage you to check out the playlists. If you're new here, there's a lot of content to unpack. Um, and you'll see I've covered a lot of topics already. And, um, yeah, I think that's all I really have to say. So as always, what we're trying to do here, stop men from self-deleting, give them a reason to keep pressing on, trying to pull them out of that valley because anything's better than self-deletion from where I sit. Even if some people really feel it's the only way out, I'd rather try to convince them otherwise if I can. Um, helping you self-improve, helping you find a better way, not making box the center because it's not. It's just not. Yes, um, our primary purpose as a species is survival and reproduction, but there's so much more to life than that. And if you just look at all the wonderful things we've created as humans in this world, you can see that very clearly. Um, and yeah, ladies, if you are listening, I hope you're learning something useful as well. You are not going to like everything that I say in this space. Some things might just outright offend you, but take what I say with a grain of salt um, stick it out with me and I, and I promise that you're probably going to learn more than you are going to get offended. At least I hope. And we're going to keep trying to build this library. We're all going to keep putting our heads together. As I said at the beginning, go check out that Sir Yidis podcast. It was really, really good. Enlightening stuff. Very based. Um, yeah, that's all I got. So I am that guy, Pete. You refuse to invite to gatherings. I hope to see you for the next one. Um, just had a bunch of markers come in, so we got a bunch of different colors now. So that's going to just, I think, enhance the, the marker board videos as well. So look forward to that. I'll see you for the next one. But for now, I'm going to head out. You take care.